thank you. So the, the IoT stuff, that's right. And um, <laughs> what I'm going to talk about mostly, it's uh, because when we talk about IoT, uh, and uh, specifically IoT botnets, uh, of course they can affect any device, right? But uh, what the attackers actually um, target is not just any device, just your, your fit, Fitbit the device on your wrist is pretty much useless for, for purposes of monetization. What they want is money at the end of the day. So what we're talking about here is mostly routers. They, they target routers because routers are very useful um, devices. They're online uh, all the time. So th they can be used very often, right? And uh, they're decent. Um, they're always connected, which is pretty good. And uh, they have decent uh, CPU capabilities. So we find that even though any device could be targeted, um, in practical terms, it's routers. So when we started looking at this, we, we, um, we realized that like 90% uh, of all of the IoT botnets are actually the same thing over and over. You, you see a stream of uh, detected malware on, on, this, uh, on this field. You see over and over and over the same guys, which is um, all of them. I'm going to tell you which ones they are in a second, but uh, you'll find that they're super, super easy to find. If you're a bad guy, you can go online to these criminal uh, underground forums and uh, you can find them dirt cheap or even for free and uh, very, very easy to set up. One of them is a little bit more difficult to set up, which means that the bad guys actually have set up services to help other criminals to set up and configure it um, correctly, this, uh, this botnet. So uh, in terms of um, ease of, uh, of setting it up, these, these three are amazing for criminals. Um, they're super, super well supported. Again, uh, you ask a question in a forum, hey, how do you do this? How do I do they're, they're there, they're, 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 the guys are there, they're experts and they know how to configure it. How to also create plugins because they're modular. So you can create a new plugin, put it in and you have a new functionality. So that's pretty good. If you're, if you're an enterprising criminal and have a great idea on how to monetize uh, one of these botnets. And then the, again, they're 90% uh, or more of the total landscape. These are the ones. The first one is Mirai, of course, open source, um, big attack in 2016. And since then, since it was open source, uh, people have been modifying it, creating new uh, modifications. So you see Mirai everywhere. Like if, if you start seeing a, a, uh, a stream of new malware being detected in the field, Lots. I'm saying that 90% is the three. I would say, I adventure to say that like 60 to 75% of all detected IoT botnets are Mirai, that, that big. The second one is Kai-10. Kai-10 is, um, is not open source, but uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of modules that uh, have come up after, after it was set up. So very easy to access, uh, pretty cheap. Again, they, they sell it to you for, for very, very low prices. And then the other one is Cuba. This is the one that is a little bit more difficult to, uh, to modify because it is open source. So you have to change the sources. So if somebody doesn't know really the, um, the, uh, how uh, 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 the source code uh, works, they might screw up, right? But uh, there's plenty of uh, criminals who give you or sell you consulting services in order for you to set up the, that botnet to your liking. So. Super easy, these are the, the baseline botnets and how do they make money out of them? So you'll see that uh, the monetization is pretty easy. First, once um, they have set up uh, an, a sizable amount of, uh, of bots, so they have a lot of uh, bots infected, the routers infected all over the world, then they can launch attacks, DDoS attacks to third parties. And then once they have that capability, what they do is they announce themselves on criminal forums saying, hey, if you want to attack your enemies for this much money, you can, uh, we can use our, our DDoS botnet and attack your enemies. They can flood anybody. You know, it's, it's, when you have like a, a few thousand routers, it's very easy to flood any website so they want to take down. So that's pretty easy. And uh, again, this is a very cheap from the criminal perspective. Um, the DDoS prices are very cheap because it, it scales so well, right? This is a kind of business that is very easy to set up and scales very well. Second way to monetize is once you have set up and uh, an IoT botnet, then you can use it as, a, as an exit node for a VPN. So you sell that capability to other criminals who then log 
into one of your routers and have an exit node as another of the routers. So that it's impossible to leave any trace or actually the, the, the trace is clear, but it's the, the IP of the exit node, which is somebody else in your infected uh, botnet. That, uh, that's very handy for criminals because uh, it uh, totally disconnects their own IP. And uh, the only trace they have, it, they leave is uh, some random IP in, a, in an IoT botnet. So it's pretty handy. And again, uh, prices for this are very cheap. So very accessible. And the, the third one is a little more complicated because it's uh, DNS based services. So what they do, it's uh, they can, uh, uh, they set up a DNS uh, in the, in the um, like DNS uh, server in the um, as part of the IoT botnet, and then uh, anybody who accesses those uh, DNSs from from the inside. So, if you have an infected router and you're inside the network, then uh, since your DNS uh, has been compromised, you're actually not doing a right um, a correct uh, DNS uh, resolution. Uh, then uh, the, the bad guy can just change bankofamerica.com instead of for the right IP for another IP that leads you to a phishing website. So what they, they sell this service to fishers, people who have phishing pages. They set up phishing pages and then they change all of the, the DNS uh, requests going to each one of those routers so that the DNS resolution is wrong and points to phishing servers. So that, that's very used in... Uh, in Brazil. So we haven't seen anywhere else, only we have seen it in Brazil, but once they have established a pretty sizable um, amount of, uh, of um, infected routers, then they, they can use it to point, not, not to bankofamerica.com, but probably bankofbrazil.com. So it's, it's a third one. It's a little more, uh, less often seen. So it's a little more rare but we have seen it. Th those are the monetization ways, which are not very many, right? Now, now we, we were asking, can this be cleaned up really? I mean, once you have a lot of uh, routers, uh, what can the user do, right? Everybody will tell you, oh no, you just clean your router, right? And then we looked, uh, we were looking at one of them, one of those uh, rare, the, the long tail of uh, IoT botnets. 90% is those baseline, right? The other 10% is made up of a lot of them different ones and smaller. This was one of them. And uh, it was taken down by, um, I fail to remember now if it was Cisco or somebody who uh, took down the servers of these ones. It was called VPN filter. And um, it was done. After six months, 2018, this botnet, we detected, we got rid of it. It's, uh, it's down. Big victory for the, for the good guys. So we started looking and VPN filter is pretty complex. There's a lot of stuff into this one. It had not only a plan A, it had only a plan B and a plan C. So for the bad guy, if they lost uh, control of the botnet, they could uh, reactivate it with a plan B and the third one with a plan C even. It was, a, they set up a special domain and it infected, uh, an infected router, even though they didn't have a CNC active because it was taken down, it was uh, actually uh, communicating to, to that domain. That's, that was it. The second, the plan B was uh, an image from Photo Bucket, which also was taken down. So plan B didn't work, but plan C was uh, grabbing an image from, from that domain to knowall.com. Also that's taken down, but what we did is uh, we re-enabled the domain and started listening to see how many of those routers were still infected as of 2020. Now, this is what, what we saw, the up and down, up and down, but we see, a pretty sizable, sizable amount, like we, we are around uh, 6,000 uh, infected routers. So clearly the question, can they be cleaned up is no, not really. I mean, you can take down the CNCs, but even though you may take down the CNCs, the, the guys, the bad guys obviously have lost all possible ways, but these things are not completely cleaned up because you have to clean them up one by one, even though the CNC might not be accessible. The, the botnet is actually up and running because the, the, the guys, uh, the infected routers are, are, still, are still there, right? They have to either disinfect them one by one or reboot them. Actually, a simple reboot wouldn't work. They thought that they did, but it doesn't. A simple reboot actually stays in a dormant state until it finally uh, gets to this to knowall.com. So 
it, 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 they were still infected. As of today, there's still about 6,000 routers infected by this. So the problem is that the routers have no antivirus, right? Most of the routers, I mean, most or all of the antivirus are completely defenseless. They don't have any real way of uh, making an antivirus. And uh, so this situation in Windows would be very easy, right? You add a new, um, a new pattern in, the, in your antivirus and boom, you, you start cleaning up infected, uh, infected malware like there's no tomorrow. It doesn't happen in the router field. It just, you know, they stay infected. There's no way to, uh, for, the, for the good guys to take down one by one, all of the, to take clean up one by one, all of those infections. The second one is that the users rarely log in. They even ever, ever log into a router to see that anything strange is happening. And even if they did, oftentimes, as in VPN filter, the effects are so minor that even if you log into the router, you don't even realize that nothing's happening. Maybe you have a little lag in your connection, right? But the effects are very, very minor. So it's super difficult to clean up this uh, effectively one by one. So actually the most effective way is uh, taking down the CNC, but taking down the CNC is going to be complicated. Now enter the third, the third element to this one. It's adding P2P features. We're starting to see some, uh, some uh, IoT botnets that have no CNC. So they have a, a P2P capability such as BitTorrent, that kind of uh, CNC. The first one we saw was a WIFATS in 2014. That was like a kind of an academic uh, botnet. The next one we saw was Hajime 2016, a little more complex, kind of like Mirai, but it kind of fell into oblivion pretty quickly. 2018, hide and seek came up. Um, it was modular, so it would adapt. It, it could accept different business plans, but we saw no, we saw nothing, and the, the the authors kind of left it left it uh, behind, right? But in 2019, Mozi came along, and Mozi does have P2P capabilities. And it's active and it's pretty, pretty darn good in capabilities for, for crime, right? On top of that, 2020, end of 2020, we saw HE, HE, H E H. Uh, that, that one has, is, uh, is uh, made in Go. Uh, so Golang uh, allows for really good, um, really good uh, plugin capabilities. So this one is perfect for cyber crime. So, the, the moment that you start seeing this as a trend, right, that there's more and more IoT botnets adding P2P capabilities, you think, okay, now we know that there's a monetization plan for these, right? We saw the monetization plan in the baseline and these ones follow. Then we saw that uh, they cannot be cleaned one by one. They, they need to be uh, taken down from the CNC, right? The CNC level, then you can do something. You can you can uh, clean up uh, uh, a sizable amount of the, uh, of the botnet. But now with a P2P, there's no CNC to clean and you cannot clean them one by one. So we have all the elements to have an eternal botnet. You cannot take them down. You need to clean them one by one, but, but you cannot clean them by, 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 one by one. So you have the perfect element for the eternal botnet. This is going to stay forever. I can foresee how uh, Mozi or, or He will stay forever and ever. It's impossible. Now, this is, this is kind of uh, doom and gloom, right? It's very difficult. We're, we're setting a scenario here where it's super, super difficult, but what's to, um, to start in uh, motivating these bad guys to start creating more and more P2P? We think that uh, the, the monetization ways so far are kind of primitive. And uh, at some point, they're going to start developing better ways of monetizing this botnet. Now we've seen that they do the DDoS thing. Now they do the VPN capability and they do the DNS, right? All of them are good, that they're great, that they really work, but it requires effort. Now we foresee, this is like uh, today, right? Uh, the current monetization, if we have to summarize it, is from the router out. So you have the, the network, the, the local network uh, in below in this picture, and you have all of the communication going out, the DDoS going out, the VPN going out, all of those packets are going from the router, from the infected router out. Now, we think that the critical mass, the point where there will be an inflection point 
uh, for, for more P2P botnet to start being created will be when they start monetizing from the router in. Because if you, if you think about it, when they have control of the router, potentially they could control anything that's coming to the router or it's going from the router out, which means that all of those connections going from the uh, internal network out, all those uh, web page uh, requests, anything coming to the router out, they, they could be they could be looked at, right? They could be uh, they could be um, mangled. They could be changed, right? Imagine uh, some computer inside the network making a request to a web page. The router potentially would be able to could be able to see the contents of that website and once the, the request has come back from the external uh, web server, they could change it and, and serve the wrong content. So they could infect potentially any computer or any device uh, that is inside the network. And uh, they could have access to all of that data. And then if they have access to that data, you could monetize that data. You, you can immediately start seeing things that you should not be seeing, right? And uh, if you could uh, infect with, with a normal malware, Windows malware or, or phone malware, uh, any device inside the network, th that's another way of monetizing. So the moment that the, the bad guys realize that having, uh, having control of the router means potentially having control of the whole network, that is when that, uh, that will be motivation enough for them to start developing these eternal botnets. So far, we're see we've seen a few. We've seen like the embryo of a problem, but this could uh, become a huge problem with the moment that they realize that having the, net, the, the, the gate, owning the gate to each one of our networks could, uh, could make them a lot more money than just sell the network for DDoS or for VPN or for any other purpose that are more pedestrian, right? This is great for them, or this could be great for them in terms of data, in, ter in terms of... Uh, infections, etc. So we believe that that would be the infection, the infection, the inflection point where that they could enable them, the bad guys, to start creating more advanced um, IoT malware. And instead of seeing 90% of the normal malware that we're seeing now, like those uh, uh, Mirai's and QBots and uh, Kaitans, instead of seeing that 90%, it could turn around and we could start seeing a 90% of, uh, of P2P botnets and the rest would be a long tail of nothingness. So that's pretty much it. Uh, that's in a nutshell. I mean, if you're interested in, in the whole uh, document, we have uh, documented what each one of these uh, five uh, P2P botnets do. And um, it's pretty interesting because uh, the history is very clear. Once the Windows uh, malware starting to start utilizing the, the P2P capabilities, it, it was it took a long time for Windows malware to, to go up to, to get up to speed, right? And now all that knowledge already exists from, from that malware. Now, once the, the bad guys have started to add those capabilities into the IoT world. Those, those malwares have been incredibly sophisticated from the get-go. In a span of like two or three years, we've seen malware that we hadn't seen in a Windows world. It took, it took like 10 years for a window in the Windows world to develop. But now that knowledge is out there. So it's just a matter of just adding it into the source code and compiling it. That's why we're seeing so um, sophisticated code being created. So since the possibilities are there, it's up to the bad guys to start adding it. And so far we're seeing that uh, it's speeding up. If you saw the first one in that timeline was 2014. And then after that, it was every two years, 2016, then 2018, but then it accelerates 2019, 2020. So we're, we're poised to see any 2021 anytime now, and probably more, it will be accelerating because they're seeing that this is great for them. It's just, a botnet that will hang out forever and ever, and it's impossible to take down by the bad, by the good guys. So hopefully this makes sense. Um, I think I'm good in time. Oh yeah, I'm great in time actually. I was a little too fast. So I don't know if we can do questions uh, now or we have to leave them for another moment.
Thank you, David. So um, the questions, the Q&A will be done in the work adventure, which is in a separate platform. So I think folks will be there. But since we have time, I have maybe one or two questions for you. Sure. Just a quick one. Uh, one is that, yes, definitely this is doom and gloom for us, incident responders, uh, especially with this eternal botnet. Uh, are you aware of any effort in the industry to engage with the vendors if they can at least harden their, their uh, products in the first place and, of course, help with the cleanup. Is there anything like that, to your knowledge? Uh, yes. Uh, there's been many um, attempts for uh, router makers to partner with security companies to create uh, security components in the routers. So ours is a TX1, like uh, the, the, the two persons were before me presenting. Uh, there's a we from micro created the TX1 along with uh, another company precisely for that, you know, to, to make it sturdier. But uh, we don't have the crit a critical mass of routers that are so far very well uh, protected by any software. So uh, we're getting there, but uh, they're, you know, we're not there yet. That's for one. And then on the other side, it's um, those companies that are trying to take down CNCs. So that, that's also a great initiative and it needs to be done because bear in mind that 90% of all those botnets are Mirais and Cubas and Kitens and they, they do have CNCs. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done there, right? And it's great yeah. that they, they take down CNCs. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we're seeing now is that if they start trending those, uh, those uh, P2P capable uh, botnets, then there's no CNC to take down. It's just trying to take down BitTorrent or Bitcoin. It's just not possible, right? So that's, that's, that's what we're seeing, right? You're totally, totally right. You know, it's doom and gloom for incident responders completely. All right. Oh, well, I guess that's how it is. Uh, and uh, we, we probably should collaborate more or in, in some ways um, to defending it. Maybe one more question since we have a few more minutes. Sure. What about the crypto miners? Like occasionally, I think in, the, in, in, in this space, we see the crypto miners or... Uh, uh, as well. Is this related to what you're talking about or are they completely different things? It's, theoretically, it's possible to create a crypto miner in these environments. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the CPUs, they're capable, but they're not so fast as to create a very good mining environment because you need a lot more CPU. Mm -hmm. So we haven't seen many. We haven't seen actually any. And bear in mind also that uh, these ones, mo most of the crypto miners that we see today are uh, on the web. So you, you create a web assembly and then that web assembly works in the context of a browser. So for this, there's no browser, it's a completely different paradigm. You'd need to infect that on the, at the CPU level, right? So you need to start running an ARM enabled miner. And uh, I don't know if there are many, but uh, they, they're not using them. Theoretically it's possible, but I uh, haven't seen them. But don't give them ideas. <laughs> That's right. All right, David, thank you so much for, uh, for the presentation.